Praise the Lord, everyone. Shine back with another video for you all. Uh, today, I just wanted to talk about um, those who believe, uh, you know, that once you come to faith, um, you can, you know, never sin. Um, they talk about you can fulfill the law. You can keep the law perfectly. And they feel as though that they're able to do it. And they will, you know, turn to certain people in the word that would seem that, you know, they never sin. Now, I actually did a separate video on this um, where I discussed that topic. But here I just wanted to show that when it comes to uh, the law, the laws of God. Essentially, whether you whether you want to use the word commandments laws statutes at the end of the day or you know essentially are you doing what god said to do at the end of the day are you doing what god said to do and you know when it comes to commandments and laws and statutes you know you have essentially you have things these rules or instructions that god has given like with the nation of Israel, he gave the law to the nation of Israel. This was something that was a national instruction, something to govern a whole nation of people. But we also see through our scripture that God would give individual commandments as well. Um, and I just want to just show that a lot of times when people who believe, uh, you know, you if you don't do enough of this, then you're going to lose salvation. Um, well, you know, the fact of the matter is, you know, if you were to just mess up one time that, you know, that's. That's more than enough to to get you to lose salvation because you're either perfect or you're not. And if you're claiming perfection off of your own works, your own merits, your own ability to follow the spirit enough then there there is no insurance if your salvation is incumbent upon how much you do of something in order to maintain it. So I just want to show that, you know, even in the Bible, there were people who felt like they were doing good enough to be right in the eyes of God. And every time they were exposed, you know, they were they were high minded and the Lord humbled them. So um, what I want to do is preference uh, use this verse here. First Samuel 15, 22 as a pre as a, uh, a, a preface or a prefix to basically what I want to talk about. It says, and Samuel said, had the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord, behold, to obey is better than, than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So um, we're going to, you know, get to this in a little bit about what led up to that. But I just want to give my own example of this. Um, now, you know, I just got done talking about, you know, you, you have national laws or instructions to govern a nation, but then you also have uh individual commandments that the lord has given so for instance you know if my if my mom were to say you know at nine o'clock i don't want you leaving this house once nine o'clock hits that's it but let's say for whatever reason let's just say it was some some trash in the house and it was kind of sneaking up the house and it was you know nine o'clock and she told me to go take out that trash you know what am i gonna do you know she told me to never go out after nine and yet she's telling me to do it in this instance well normal practice is you know for me not to go out but if she's telling me something specifically at that in that moment in time i'm going to obey her so it's not so much the rules i'm obeying i'm obeying the rule giver the law giver um so a lot of times you know people will actually without realizing it give give more credence to 
the law as opposed to the law giver. So here we see, you know, it's better to obey than to sacrifice. So if the Lord says something, you know, even if his rules normally will guide you to do this, if, if he's giving you um, executive rights to do something um, for whatever, you know, reason he will want, then you would obey him. So if we go to James 2, 10 and 11, he says, for whoever shall keep the whole law and yet offend at one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now, if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So the fact that you can, uh, if you offend one point of what God says to do and you're guilty of them all, well, how is that possible if you haven't done them all literally? How, why is James saying that? Because it's not about necessarily the law in and of itself. It's about the one who gave the law. So you are a, you can you can be guilty of all the laws because you are guilty of being disobedient to the one that gave all the laws. So when it comes to, you know, people who say, you know, you got to keep the laws, statutes and commandments, you know, you'll hear black, black Hebrew Israelites say that you got to keep the law, statutes and commandments. But honestly, who has ever what man has ever met the standard of God? And we're not even including, you know, Jesus Christ, because, you know, he's God himself. He's he's he is also the son of man. But outside of Christ, what man could possibly meet the standard of Christ? I mean, like, just think about that. So, you know, we're seeing here, you know, James says you fell in one, you know, you're guilty of them all, even if you don't do one thing, but you do another. So, you know, this also goes for people who believe in in losing salvation. You know, they'll they don't for whatever reason, they don't seem to understand that, you know, if you just mess up in one part, you're guilty of them all. Because you're dis being disobedient to the one who who gave it, who gave the instructions. So I just want to go to there's three different instances that we'll see in Scripture where people who thought they were doing good actually were exposed to be doing otherwise. So here in Matthew 23, 23, Christ says, Woe unto you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have omitted the weightier matters of the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. These are ye to have done and not to leave the other undone. So here... In one sense, Christ is acknowledging that they are doing some of the law. And, you know, he says that they tithe. But then he says they omit the weightier parts of uh, the weightier matters of the law. So there are actually everything. First of all, let's get this out of the way. First, everything that God says is important. Everything that God says is to be obeyed. So, you know, Christ is not trying to necessarily uh, downplay certain things to say, well, that's not important. But he says, you know, there are things that are more important, not the fact that they shouldn't be obeyed, but there are things that are just more important. And he's saying that you have the law, judgment, mercy, and faith. So they're doing some things, but then they're also doing, not doing some other things. So they thought that they were following the law well enough to be right in the eyes of God. And Christ says, it says, these are ye to have done and not leave the other undone. So there were some things they were doing and then some things that they weren't doing. So here we see that, you know, just like we see in today's time, there are people who feel like they're doing enough. Lo and behold, Christ in his same scenario is letting them know, no, you're not doing as much as you think you are. So here in Matthew 19, 16 through 24, we have uh, the account of uh, the rich young ruler or the rich young man. And he asked Christ, he says, you know, how, um, you know, do I obtain eternal life? And uh, 
Christ says, you know, about keeping the commandments. And so this man says, well, I've been doing everything, you know, from a youth. And so then, first of all, first of all, I don't even think that, you know, this man has actually done it perfectly, you know, and that's, you know, that's just me. Um, but let's just say for the sake of argument that this man has done it perfectly. Christ, the man says, you know, what, what else do I lack here in verse 20? And then Christ answers him in verse 21. He says, if thou will be perfect, go and sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. 22. But when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful, sorrowful for he had great possessions. So here, this man, you know, he, he claims that he did everything right, right, from the fact that he was a youth. So he felt that he was doing good enough. And Christ, you know, out of everything he could have said, he told him to, to sell what he had. His great, and the man went away sad because he had great possessions. So, you know, why would Christ pinpoint that? You know, now me personally... I feel since since Christ knows the heart, I feel like he was showing this man that, you know, your merits are not as good as you think they are. And he went to the thing that actually meant the most to him, which was his possessions. And the man just turned away sorrowful. And, you know, we don't know anything else after that. But in that moment, you know, he just went away sad, you know. Because he didn't want to do what Jesus has said. So here again is a person who felt that they were doing good enough to be right in the eyes of God. And yet they were not. And so here in Luke 10, 25 to 37, we see another man. Um, and these are all Jews, by the way. This man, if we look um we see he's asking, you know, also, what, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? So he's asking the same question as a rich, the rich young man we just read about. And, you know, he gives he actually gives the right answer when Christ Christ asks him, he says, you know, what, what does the law say? The man responds with the right answer. Um, and in that, if we look down to verse twenty nine, the man says, or it's written, it says, but he willing to justify himself said unto Jesus, who is my neighbor. Now, you know, you know, when it says neighbor, it just means, you know, f your fellow man, not, not necessarily to say the person who lives next to you. So it says, who is my neighbor? So from this, Jesus gives this parable about this, this Jewish person who, you know, was robbed and basically left, left for dead. Or left him half dead. Three different people passed by this 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 person that came down from Jerusalem to Jericho. A priest, as we see in thirty one, a Levite, as we see in thirty two, and then you have a Samaritan. Now the Samaritan, you would you would have thought that the priest and the Levite would have had compassion for their own. But we actually see this Samaritan person actually stop and help this Jewish person who was robbed and, and, you know, basically left for dead. He had compassion for him. So basically, at the end of it all, you know, Christ says out of these three who passed him, who was, you know, who was the neighbor and he says, well, you know, the Samaritan and, you know, he he was actually right. So, you know, the fact that this man was it says that he was he was trying to justify himself. So when it comes to eternal life, you know, Christ said, what does the law say? What readest thou? And he said, you know, to love the Lord thy God with all your you know, heart, mind and soul and to love your neighbor. Then he said he looked to, to justify himself and he said, well, who is my neighbor? So, you know, he. 
he basically wanted to justify himself by saying, okay, well, as, as long as I look out for my own, you know, that is my neighbor. And the the thing that Christ is basically exposing him for is not just your own Jewish brethren, but it just goes for people in general. So, you know, the fact that he had this mindset, it just exposed him to say, you are not as good as you think you are. So every time we see these instances where people think they're doing good enough to to be right in the eyes of God, each and every time we see that that is not the case. So, you know, for people who believe in losing salvation, people who believe in, uh, you know, you got to keep doing you know, following the laws and this and the third in order to maintain salvation, we see that is not possible. That's not possible because what man can, like I said again, what man can live up to the standards of God? Even Christ himself said the flesh is weak, but the spirit is willing. So, and, and Paul says in Romans how he says how uh, the law is holy, but he also says how the law is powerless in that it was made weak through the flesh. So it's not the fact that there's anything wrong with the law. It's the fact that through our flesh that that law cannot justify us because as a man, we cannot live up to the standards of God. That's why we needed a savior. That's why he saves us. And that's why he he keeps us saved, not us ourselves. He does. So now we're just going to look at what led up to the verse. First Samuel uh, 15 and 22. And we're going to look look up to to how that happened. So essentially, um, Saul Samuel uh, was sent out by the Lord to anoint um, Saul as king over Israel and Samuel uh, relayed a message from the Lord to Saul that he was to go and to basically um, wipe out the uh, Amalekites. That was like their judgment um, for them, what they did to Israel. So in doing so, they was, he was supposed to wipe out everything out nothing was supposed to be left standing unfortunately um the amalekite king uh he was actually left alive and then there were uh i guess like the best animals the best sheep here we see in verse nine the best sheep oxen and fatlings um and lambs all that was good was not utterly destroyed so we actually see that, you know, we understand that in the Ten Commandments, it says thou shalt not kill. But here we're seeing that the Lord not only said to go and kill, but the Lord said to wipe everything out. Don't leave anything standing. So. If we look. We actually see. We see in verse 13, it says, And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. So in Saul's eyes, he did what the Lord asked. But we know that the Lord told him to wipe everything out, and yet and still he didn't do that, but he still felt like he followed God's commandment. So, okay, so let's keep going. Verse 14, and Samuel said, well, what meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen, which I heard, which I hear? So Samuel saying, okay, well, why do I hear animals? If you follow the commandment of the Lord, I shouldn't hear anything. Everything should, should have been wiped out. 15, and Saul said, they brought, they have brought them from the Amalekites. For the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God. And the rest we have utterly destroyed. Now, you know, this was part of the law 
to give the the best, um, the unblemished, the spotless uh, animals, um, lambs, sheep, goats, bulls. So that was actually part of the law, the sacrificial law to sacrifice um, to the Lord. But in that moment, God told him to do something else. He said to to wipe everything out. Don't leave anything, no oxen, no suckling, nothing. And yet they didn't do that. But still in Saul's mind, he performed the commandment of the Lord. You see, you see how that kind of goes. People think that they're doing what thus saith the Lord, like a hundred percent fully when in actuality they're not, but you know, they focus on what they want to focus on. So that's how in their mind they're doing enough. Okay, let's keep going. 16. Then Samuel said unto Saul, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord has said to me this night. And he said unto him, stay on, stay on. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, wast thou not made the head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed the king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, go and utterly destroy the sinners of the Amalekites and find against them until they be consumed. Basically, he's saying until everything is consumed. Wherefore, then, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord, and have gone the way which the Lord sent me, and have brought Agag the king of uh, Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people of the spoil, but the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And so here's the verse in question. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. So now here, you know, again, Saul felt like he did what the Lord wanted him to do. It's, it's like, OK, I know that in the law, this is sacrificial laws. So even though the Lord is telling me to do one thing, let me do this other part. Because this is part of the law. So let me let me do the even the Lord, even though the Lord is telling me to wipe out everything. Let me not do that because of this. But see, then it, but that goes back to people looking more at the the law as opposed to the law giver. OK, we're not we're not we're not obeying in, in all actuality. We're not necessarily obeying this checklist of rules. We are obeying the rule giver, the law giver. So in this instance, the Lord told him to do something else and he didn't do it. So let's look at 23 for rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. He hath also rejected thee from being king. And Samuel said and Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So you see, you see, it says that he transgressed the commandment of the Lord. So this wasn't what the Lord asked or required of, of Saul to do. This was not a, a national thing. This was something specifically that the Lord told Saul to do, and he did not do it. Therefore, he did not keep all of the commandments. And you will have people that say you have to follow all of God's commandments. OK, are you just focusing on the ones that govern the nation? Or are you considering everything, even what, you know, God would say specifically? And in this instance, he did not do that. So, you know, you will have people that will refer back and and say, well, look at this person, look at that person. 
You know, they, it said that they were perfect. They were upright people like Job. But if you keep reading Job sin, people like Zacharias and Elizabeth. But if you keep reading in Luke one, you actually see that, you know, they themselves sin. And you think about Moses. Moses broke a commandment, you know, of God. God told Moses to speak to the rock. Moses hit it with his staff. That was the reason why he wasn't able, he wasn't permitted to go into the promised land. Because he disobeyed. That was a straight command, a commandment, and he did not follow it. Now, so, you know, why do I bring all this up? Well, you know, for one, I just want to show that people who believe and, you know, you have to keep all the the law, statutes and commandments, you know, and they'll go to the Bible. Well, we're seeing here that, you know, people who think they are doing so are actually exposed to them not doing it. And. Whenever they say you have to follow this law, statutes, and the commandments, they're looking at the national laws, things that govern Israel as a nation. But they're not, I'm assuming they're not even considering those personal commandments that God would give to a person individually. Just thus saith the Lord, I want you, so and so, to do this. That is a commandment, not a national command but a personalized command to that person. So, you know, for those who say, say you have to do this and that, and they go to the Bible and try to use these examples, well, we see that, hey, well, that's not the case. If you're not doing every single thing, and this goes back to James 2 that we read, you fell in one point of what God says, guess what? You're guilty of them all because you're disobedient to the one that gave all the laws. And that's the thing. So, also, how can this apply for us today? Well, you know, have you ever felt led of the spirit? Have you ever felt led to go do something? I just want to look at this. Here in Acts 8, 26-29, it's uh, Philip. And Philip was actually told by the Holy Spirit to go speak to the Ethiopian eunuch who was reading the book of Isaiah. Now, have you ever felt, you know, led that the Holy Spirit is saying, you know, go talk to that person, go witness to that person. Or if you're driving and you see some a homeless person and you just felt compelled to stop and, you know, give them some money or buy them some food or something, and you don't, are you then following or not following the commandment of the Lord? You know, even, even, I would say even breaking the speed limit, even breaking the speed limit, because Christ talks about following governments and institutions and following the laws of the land. And as long as those laws do not conflict with what God would have us to do, we are to, you know, follow those laws. So and it doesn't matter to say, well, I did it in the heat of the moment or whatever, whatever. Did have you have you ever broken the speed limit? Because if you have, you've broken a law. And if God says to follow the laws of the land and you've broken a law of the land, then what does that mean? You've actually transgressed against the Lord. It doesn't matter to say, well, you know, it's in the heat of the moment or I was trying to hurry up and. You know, did you break the speed limit? So, you know, again, a lot of times people want to focus on what they want to focus on as opposed to simply, uh, you know, are they doing everything? It's not about just, well, you know, this is what I think. And, and as long as I'm doing this, I'm good. 
you know, or they'll say, well, as long as I'm not doing willing sin, which I believe everybody can still sin willfully and, and do at some point in time or another sin willfully. And then they'll try to switch it up some more. Well, you know, as long as I'm not practicing it or making a lifestyle of it. Well, what constitutes a practice or what constitutes a lifestyle? There is no there is no no quantity that defines quote unquote practice or a quote unquote lifestyle. It's just the normalcy of your life. If you sin once a day. Is that practice or a lifestyle of sin? If you sin once a week or once a month or once a year. Out of those four, what's a practice or what's a lifestyle? Technically, all four would be a lifestyle or practice of sin in this topic because it's just. You know, if you still sin, you sin. Now, you can sin more than others. You can sin less than others. But if you still sin, you still sin. And a lot of people like to add these things that the Bible doesn't add. If you, you know, willfully sin. And now I know they look at Hebrews ten twenty six, but, you know, I believe that had to do with uh, rejecting Christ after being exposed to the gospel. But they'll say, you know, if you willing, if you willfully sin or, you know, uh, if you make a lifestyle of it or, or practice it. But the Bible never gives a threshold to say how much of something constitutes a practice or a lifestyle. But really, it's not a quantity. It's just. Do you do it? Then it's a part of your track record. It's a part of your lifestyle. Now, you can work and you can grow, which the Bible says we are to do. But a lifestyle is a lifestyle. Whatever you do is part of your practice. Whatever you do is part of your lifestyle. So all this just to show that it's grace that saves us and it's grace that keeps us. So no amount of sin can ever undo that. Just the way being born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob makes a person an Israelite of a chosen nation is the same way being born again through Christ makes us a child of God. And no Israelite can ever stop being an Israelite no matter how disobedient they are, like in the physical so in the same way, no amount of disobedience can ever undo us to be a child of God. Now, this is not to advocate sin because that that always tends to be the angle that's used. You're, you're using it as a license of sin. No, this is not that. But this is just to understand grace and the, the necessity of it. And thank God for his grace. Because what assurance will we have if it was incumbent upon what we do and how much of it? So I pray that God got the glory first and foremost out of this video. And I pray whoever sees this video will be edified and blessed by it. So until next time, I love you all and God bless.